All right, it is 12 o'clock Eastern. I think it's a great time for us to start. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to a webinar, Making Sense of COVID-19 Startup and Small Business Resources webinar. webinar. Uh, so from the CARES Act to its Paycheck Protection Program and from the Small Business Administration's Economic Injury Disaster Loans to uh, grants and loans from large companies, the array of resources available to startups and small businesses negatively affected by COVID-19 can be confusing to navigate, but potentially rewarding for those who avail themselves of the support that currently exists. Unfortunately, today we have three excellent panelists uh, who are going to help us to understand and navigate these sometimes crazy waters uh, and understand then what the act means to us and what resources are available. So, um, you know, in order to help with this, I want to go over just a few logistics um, before we launch into the panelists. Um, there are a variety of resources, and um, Nick Swisher uh, with uh, the Idea Center at the University of Notre Dame has prepared a website with links to all of the resources. So the panelists are going to mention resources. They're going to mention websites. We have that. That's going to be available to all of the participants. Um, in addition, this program is going to be recorded. So in the future, if there was somebody who has not or who are, is not able to participate, uh, they will also be able to, uh, to watch this. And then you can fast forward my sections and get to the really important people, the great panelists. Uh, and then also the first 40 minutes of this webinar, the, the panelists will be answering questions that have been prepared. Uh, previously. So they've seen these questions, they've had some time to prepare. Um, and then the last 20 minutes are going to be dedicated to you, the participants, to ask questions. So uh, on your Zoom screen, you will see uh, a link that says Q&A. Um, please press Q&A, and that's how you will submit all of the questions. Then those questions are going to be annotated by Nick and Jesse Vogel uh, with the Idea Center. And, um, and then they'll, I will then ask those questions of the panelists. So welcome everyone. So glad that you are here. Really excited for um, our great panelists. I am James Thompson. I'm the Associate Vice President for Innovation at the Idea Center at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, and excited to be talking to you from actually a sunny day in South Bend. We don't see that very often. Um, so I'd like to introduce our three awesome panelists. Uh, our first panelist is uh, Galen. <clears throat> Galen, um, so Galen Mason is a partner at Michael, Michael Best and Friedrich and represents companies, founders, management, and investors in entrepreneurial endeavors, many of which involve building enterprises that have never before been built. He works with clients across the country involved in all manner of go-to market strategies, B2B, B2C, marketplace, SaaS, manufacturing and distribution, and across numerous industries. Welcome, Galen. So excited you're here. Um, Alan Steele, super excited for Alan to be here. Alan Steele is regional director of the Indiana Small Business Development Center, the SBDC, forwarding the organization's mission to have a positive and measurable impact on the formation, growth, and sustainability of small businesses. Alan joined the Indiana SBDC as a business advisor in 2008 after holding senior level business development and general management roles in both manufacturing and service industries. He has served as regional director since 2014. And in that time, Alan has advised more than 1,300 small business owners and aspiring entrepreneurs while working with the Indiana SBDC and was named the organization's state star in 2015. Super excited to have Alan with us today. And last but not least, we have Martin Tierney. Uh, Martin is a partner in the Employment Benefits Group at Michael Best and Friedrich. Um, and by the way, great law firm. Sorry, just a shameless plug. It's wonderful that they're here doing this. Uh, Notre Dame uses them for IP counsel. Just love working with, uh, with Michael Best. Martin has more than 20 years of experience in the employee benefits area, including executive compensation, equity compensation, qualified retirement plans, welfare benefits, 
and global benefit arrangements. Martin is a frequent speaker and writer on issues concerning employee, employee benefits with a focus on executive compensation. Martin received a BA in political science from the University of Chicago and a JD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's an adjunct professor at Marquette University Law School and a member of both the Wisconsin Bar Association and the Illinois State Bar Association. Welcome, Martin. Okay, so <clears throat> now Galen has graciously offered to kick us off and give us an introduction to the CARES Act, to Paycheck Protection Program, to all of these resources. Um, and so let's launch it off. Galen, would you, would you cap, start this all off and, and give us an intro to all the great resources that the government has provided? Uh, thanks, Jim. Um, first of all, thank you to you and to Notre Dame. It's nice to be here. Um, we've been doing a lot of these lately. Um, oh, why don't I give a quick 30,000 foot view of the CARES Act? So it's the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act. It was passed into law uh, March 27th. So uh, for Martin, myself, a number of other lawyers, and I'm sure lawyers and accounts across the country, it's been a very busy uh, three weeks. Um, so, uh, uh, and since that act was passed, it's about 350 single space, 800 pages. Uh, it, it contains a number of things that all of us have been parsing through. Uh, I guess a couple things I want to mention before putting uh, the act and some other acts that were passed and some that we expect to come uh, in context. This was passed quickly. It was designed, and, and I've never seen anything like it. I'm 43 years old, never seen anything come together this, this fast. Uh, and, th and there's pros and cons to that. The, the pros are we're getting money to many, many people that need it. The cons are, uh, as we have all the time to parse through these things, we realize some of the sentences and wording and intentions may not have been exactly what everyone talked about. So our goal here today and what Martin and others and I have been doing is um, trying to bring clarity uh, wherever we can, but also acknowledging where there is something when something is not clear and helping clients and folks figure out how to deal with that. Uh, so the law itself was put in place um, about three weeks ago, March 27th on a Friday night. Uh, there have been, uh, I want to say, two uh, Treasury regulations issued since then and a number of SBA FAQs, which have been very helpful for the Paycheck Protection Program and the EIDL. The law is, the CARES Act is the second iteration of stimulus. The first one uh, passed a few weeks before that was the Families First Coronavirus uh, Act, and that dealt more with uh, employment stuff as opposed to uh, getting cash to small business. We think there will be uh, a third stimulus, uh, but before we get to that, and before I summarize some of what's in the CARES Act, uh, the primary uh, program is the Paycheck Protection Program, and that is essentially uh, a loan from the government, which can be up to 100% forgiven if it's used for particular purposes. I think the elephant in the room here today, Monday morning, is whether that program is going to receive more funding because last Thursday night it ran out. So before I go do a quick overview of that uh, and the other programs under the CARES Act, Martin's going to give us a brief overview, I think, of uh, what our strategies group, our lobbyist group uh, in D.C. is telling us on the status of uh, an extension. Thanks, Galen. So our groups have been following this really closely. It's a big deal. There's a lot of wrangling. Fundamentally, there's been a little bit of disagreement between the sides as to what gets funded right now along with PPP funding. And the argument has been over whether there should be, in addition to the small business funding, funding for hospitals and state and local governments uh, and testing. Right now, the latest I have heard is that there will be about another 310 billion for the PPP, which ran, which you know, as, as everyone knows, ran out on Thursday or Friday. Uh, probably 75 million for hospitals, probably 25 million for or billion. I'm sorry, <laughs> I got to use the bigger the, the B's instead of the M's. Um, the uh, uh, so 75 billion for hospitals, 25 billion for testing. That's what we're hearing. Uh, keep you know, your eyes peeled uh, on the news to see what does finally happen. Uh, but with that, I'll turn it back to Galen because we think this is very, very likely to happen. So this program is alive and well, even if you didn't get 
your uh, loan request in the first time. Galen? Great. Um, so it's worth, it's worth going through this. That was our, our intro point. Um, so so I'll, what I want to do is the CARES Act covers all sorts of things. So um, Martin's going to cover a couple of those. There's some uh, payroll tax credit um, credits where you, the government will give you money uh, that you can avoid remitting to them. There's some deferrals. Um, there's some money for what I call uh, very big businesses that's allocated by industry. There's the Main Street Lending Program, which I find is a little bit confusing because that's for, for the larger businesses that are not eligible for the uh, Paycheck Protection Program, some of the other things. Uh, the, the two programs that I'm going to talk about uh, briefly and give you a quick overview of before we dive into questions are the, uh, the uh, Paycheck Protection Program um, and then the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. So both of these programs are additions to an existing SBA rubric. So historically, the SBA was the part of the government that would make loans to small business just as a matter of course to get them up and running, largely when they didn't have uh, credit available elsewhere, or uh, as the disaster loan program uh, implies, to go in and make loans to folks um, that had been hit by, say, it, I grew up in Kansas City, so the example that always comes to mind for me is a tornado. <laughs> and businesses there where no one's coming to the restaurant uh, because uh, the town's been decimated. So the SBA would come in and make these emergency uh, economic injury disaster loans. Um, so under the CARES Act, uh, two things. The, uh, the EIDL, which is this economic injury disaster loan, is supercharged. So I, the term I've been using, for lack of a better word, is supercharged EIDL. Uh, and essentially, the way that those work is you apply directly to the SBA. You demonstrate that you have had some sort of economic injury or disaster damage. They look at your books. They figure out what sort of loan you would be entitled to, and they extend you a loan. Historically, any amounts under those loans were, or uh, any amount over $25,000 had to be personally guaranteed, and it was a secured loan to, that, um, to the borrower. Uh, as you might imagine, we have now supercharged that under the CARES Act where uh, folks can apply. Uh, it is up to $2 million, but only $200,000 of that can be unsecured without a personal guarantee. Most of our startup clients, uh, most of our small business clients are keenly aware of when they need to or don't need to uh, make a personal guarantee on a loan. So that $200,000 limit is something you want to be aware of. It's not something that shows up on the form because this process unlike the Paycheck Protection Program we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, it's, it's an application and you're approved for a certain amount, and then you can decide whether you're going to take that amount. You want to be cognizant of that $200,000 threshold. Uh, the term of that loan uh, is up to 10 years, and it's 3.75% interest, so it's relatively low percentage of interest. Um, the, also, uh, there's a program, uh, it's often called a grant. I think that's a little bit confusing, but uh, the moment you apply for that loan, Remember, so much of this is about uh, getting money to businesses as fast as possible. And this is the government. It doesn't move lightning fast, but I will tell you by any other standard, this is pretty fast, close to lightning fast in terms of government speed. Um, they need to give you, if you apply, $10,000 within three days. We have heard anecdotally that that's not actually happening. Uh, and even if you're turned down, you can keep that. That's why they call it a grant. Um, so whether they're, I think to some extent they've just been overwhelmed. So that program, um, again, is administered by the SBA. And that brings me a little bit to the Paycheck Protection Program, because I think one of the core differences is uh, Congress recognized that there were going to be uh, millions of people that needed these loans, hundreds of thousands of small businesses, uh, and the SBA alone would be overwhelmed. So in fact, I think it has been uh, I, I can tell you, I'm sure that they're doing the best they can, but, and it's probably not fast enough, but I know from any interactions we at Michael Best have had with them, uh, they're moving as quickly as they can and they understand the need. So quick, and we'll have a bunch of, we can field a bunch of questions on this. I'm sure folks have questions on the EIDL program. The other program, it's sort of the main star of the CARES Act is the Paycheck Protection Program. And the, the, the high level overview of that program is it is a loan from the SBA, uh, it's, it, it is uh, ultimately forgivable if spent on certain things during a particular period of time. Uh, so you can, so, those, so let me back up. You can, the amount you can borrow under this loan, it's the greater of two and a half times your average payroll during 
either 2019 or a rolling 12 months. You can choose either one. You obviously would want to pick the one that allowed you to have a higher average monthly payroll or $10 million. There may be some uh, businesses out there uh, that if you add up two and a half months of their payroll, they exceed $10 million. So there's a cap on that program. You can borrow that money uh, so long as from the day that you receive it, so long as you're spending it on certain things, payroll, uh, mortgage interest, rent, certain utilities and interest on debt that existed, that amount will be forgiven. However, or let me back up, that amount would be the, that would generate the maximum amount that can be forgiven. Uh, but that forgiveness amount will be reduced uh, if you reduce your headcount as measured by the period February 15th uh, through, well, I'm sorry, it's February 15th through June 30th of 2020, as compared to what I call the 2019 snapshot. Well, the, the, the SBA will look at a period of time, uh, February to June of 2019, and then compare that um, during to the period uh, here in 2020. And Martin, I, I realize I just misspoke. I think the actual period is the eight week period beginning when you take out the loan. Um, if you compare the times and, and if you have, say 10 people in 2019 and eight people now, you would take a 20% reduction uh, on your maximum potential forgiveness. Uh, there's been a lot of talk. So that's the high level overview of what uh, you're eligible for. I'm sure we'll get into on this call uh, what specifically, how do you determine payroll costs, uh, you know, all the nitty gritty that goes into managing this process, particularly we talk about how banks have managed this. Um, but, uh, and th that's also a core distinction here is that banks are managing this process. It's not through the SBA. So you would need to go to an existing uh, approved SBA lender. Most big banks meet that criteria uh, and they're managing that process. I will tell you, we are seeing the criteria for banks very wildly. So uh, the government wanted to incentivize banks to make these loans very quickly and very easily. Uh, they only technically need to require uh, very little certifications and confirm a few things from the borrowers, but banks are, have been thrown uh, kind of into the mix very quickly and they wanna make sure that they're not putting out money that they're not gonna get back from the government. So some of what we're hearing and some of what we've seen from the marketplace is that they may be requiring more than what's what's required under the law. Um, but that process is moving, so just work carefully with your banker. Again, I know we'll have some questions here too. Uh, the next thing too that I'll touch on uh, in a little bit reverse order here uh, before turning this over to kind of go to some questions um, is eligibility. So who's eligible for the Paycheck Protection Program? The rule is uh, essentially, at a high level, the rule is any business with 500 or fewer employees, but the way the law is written, uh, you had to be a small business concern under the old rules. So the, remember all of these programs were dropped into the SBA rubric that preexisted uh, the supercharged DIDL and the Paycheck Protection Program. So there's a website you can go to, you plug in your NAICS code, which you find on your tax return, or in some cases, some employee benefit documents, and it'll tell you, oh, you are a small business as defined uh, by the SBA. So you either meet that standard or you have 500 or fewer employees. In some cases, you will find when you plug in the old rule, uh, the NAICS code, that it may, under the SBA rules, you may be allowed to have 1,200 employees or 1,500 employees, or it may give you a revenue number. So you would look to that number to determine uh, whether you're eligible. The last thing I'll mention, I know we're gonna get in this, is particularly for startups and venture-backed companies, that rule uh, as to whether you're eligible based on headcount or revenue, it can depend on not just your business, but certain owners in your business. So there's some things called affiliation rules that may require you to count heads uh, of your VC investor, and whether they're a venture capital investor or another investor, it may require you to count uh, heads in addition to your own that could put you out of eligibility. We'll talk a little bit more about that. I think uh, most of us are getting very comfortable that there are either not issues there, or if there are, a good lawyer can solve those for you. And some of the guidance that's been issued does, in fact, bless having a lawyer modify some of the contractual control provisions to uh, avoid problems in that area. So it's a, it's a detailed area. Hopefully that wasn't too much of a mishmash summary. Uh, but maybe before we dive into those questions, I do know Martin and I have been working closely on a couple other programs uh, that are available where it's some cash from the government it tends to be a little bit less cash, but it's important that folks be aware of these. 
Okay, excellent. Thank you, Galen. And thank you, Martin. I really appreciate it. Uh, that was a great introduction. Um, you know, it, 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 something that I, I, I'm really wondering about is, would somebody maybe give us a, an overview of um, what the loan application process for the Paycheck Protection Program is like? Uh, you're, a, you're a small business, you're a company. What does that look like? You know, what do you, what do you first do? You find, okay, I, I want to I apply for this. What do you do next? Yes, Martin. So uh, the first thing you do, I think the absolute step one is start calling your bankers, especially people you've worked with before uh, that have some experience with you. They're fundamentally who's going to walk you through the basic application process. As you do that, they'll give you an application, either a form that the SBA has put out or maybe their modified version of it, maybe they have it online, uh, and you'll work through that application. Uh, we find invariably that there are some vagaries, questions, some lack of clarity in all of that. Um, I saw one of the questions on our questions list was, do I need a lawyer? No, you don't need a lawyer, but if you look at those questions, you're not sure, and you need help answering them, that would be, uh, we would recommend reaching out there, especially if your banker uh, is kind of waffling on the answer, or sometimes your banker will say, that's really complicated, you should talk to a lawyer. My guess is your banker will say that when you start talking about your ownership and how you're owned by three other companies, but you own this company and though all of those affiliation interactions, which get very complicated. But the process overall runs primarily through the banks uh, and they are operating with the kind of basic SBA application form that was for lack of a better term, slapped together for this process. Yeah, thank you, right, right, right. Now, um, thank you, Martin, that was really helpful. Galen, you mentioned uh, uh, that you're seeing a wide variety of, of criteria that banks are using to determine whether someone is a, uh, uh, approved or not. Um, it, maybe could you, could you give us a feel for um, on uh, the extremes, uh, what you're seeing the banks are really looking for when they review the application? So I think what, what banks ultimately need, well, by law, they need to do two things. Um, they, need to, they need to confirm two things. They need to confirm uh, that the business was in existence on February 15th and it had payroll or there was a sole proprietor. Uh, we we kind of confirm that. that that's, that's the underwriting criteria under the law. So if you think about that, that's sort of, does the patient have a pulse? It's yeah. very, very loose, right? Um, Everything else is very much self-certification. So the, uh, the law says that uh, borrowers or small businesses can say, this is, these are my payroll costs. This is, they can sort of certify all this other information and the bank doesn't have to worry about confirming that information in order to secure their guarantee. That being said, banks are asking for much more than that and often uh, broad, like asking for things that are a little bit more broad. So um, for an example, an extreme example too that I've seen is, I've seen the Paycheck Protection Program have some of the requirements uh, from a covenant perspective. So covenant being a promise about how the business will operate into the future. I've seen a large national bank's uh, form include a covenant that says, we won't make dividends or we won't, won't make shareholder distributions. These are, these are features that remind us of the TARP era uh, restrictive provisions uh, from the bank days of the financial crisis, those provisions do exist in the Main Street Lending Program. If you're going to avail yourself, if you're a big business and you're going to avail yourself of those, you can't. You know, there's going to be restrictions on executive compensation and things like that. That's not a part of the Paycheck Protection Program. So I've seen that in bank materials, and it shouldn't be there, right? So that's another one. Uh, I've seen personal guarantees in the the loan language. So I've seen you know, a, a signature line that says we personally guarantee anyone signing this loan application personally guarantees it. Um, and that's just not right. And so I think the other thing I, I want to mention is, again, Mar is March 27th is when this law came out. It, the law itself came together quickly. So uh, it's not particularly well written. And I don't say that because uh, I want to criticize any of the folks that wrote it. I think they did an incredible job. Uh, and I think the SBA is doing an incredible job. And I think that the banks are doing an incredible job. It's that they're doing any, like anything in life, if you do it in a rush, there's going to be a mess. And you're also going to look to your historical practices. 
And when banks lend money, they ask for a lot more than just did you exist on February 15th. So it's a real deviation from how they've historically operated. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I think that's really helpful. So, so let's say you're a, a small business and you have applied and you're, you, you, you've been subject to the criteria of your particular bank. Um, what are the recourses if you are denied? Like what, what do you do? What, what are you seeing companies doing if they, they're denied? Well, so we've seen, and I, I can let some of the other panelists uh, weigh in as well, but the answer is you really need to work with them to uh, explain to them that something that they've done is not within the rules. And so uh, you may need to get legal counsel involved. You don't need to. I hate to see that happen. I don't think, uh, you know, if I'm running a Subway sandwich shop, I might not have the resources to go get a lawyer versus, you know, a 450 uh, headcount company may already have legal counsel on staff that can help weigh in and straighten out uh, how, to, how to operate that with the bank. But you really need to work with your bank and get up to speed on how it works. The other thing you can do is you can go to another bank. Um, you, you, there's nothing that says you can't apply a second time. You can't have two PPP loans out at the same time, right? So you ultimately can't uh, get one at one bank and another at another. Uh, but you just need to, I think, keep trying. Okay. There is Alan, no, one of, one, of, yeah. one of the things too I'll mention is there has been some initial litigation. Uh, I know this group was talking about it yesterday. Um, that was, that's been so far, that's been shot down by federal district court judges saying that there's no cause of action to bring uh, against the banks. And those tended, uh, the, the cases that I, that I, the one I read this weekend and then Nick had routed one this morning, tended to uh, discuss um, one additional requirements, right? So this issue that we were just talking about is, can I sue my bank if they're if they're adding additional requirements? And uh, the the court didn't ad even address the issue; it just uh, it dismissed the case. So te technically, that's a no. The other one too that I saw just I think a few minutes before this call was that some of the more recent case law centers around banks having uh, preferential treatment and who they gave loans to and possibly doing it in a way that maximized the fees that they were able to charge. I will tell you, I found when I read that article again, just a few minutes before the call, I found it interesting because the banks are paid a higher percentage. They're allowed, they, you know, the amount of money that they're allowed to collect uh, is based uh, on a fee, a basis point fee on the amount of the loan. And the larger the loan, the lower the fee. Mm -hmm. So in, in theory, uh, banks are incentivized to process the smaller business loans before the larger small business loans. So I, I thought that was an interesting uh, case. We'll that, see where that, that goes. Really, yeah, yeah, that is really interesting. Um, Alan, what are you seeing? Um, that, that, uh, what are the experiences that you're finding companies here in Northern Indiana? Um, what are they seeing? What are you seeing? Oh, looks, oh there we go. <laughs> there we go. Um, I think like everybody else, there's been a fair amount of confusion, especially in the early days. Um, one thing that hasn't been mentioned yet that I think we might want to, uh, to bring up goes into the calculation of payroll and the fact that a lot of smaller and earlier stage companies may have um, quote unquote employees who they're actually paying on 1099s as independent contractors. Mm -hmm. So we've had a lot of questions around that and 1099 employees uh, cannot be counted as payroll. Um, as independent contractors, technically they could go apply for a PPP themselves, uh, but they cannot be included in the company's payroll total. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. So, so we're seeing then um, that we've got this great program, the PPP. Now they're out of money, but it looks like they're going to get money soon. It looks like it's going to be in the, in the billions, a few hundred billion dollars. And it's up to the banks to decide yes or no. Um, and the federal court system, then uh, what I'm hearing, Galen, Martin, that the federal courts are really supporting the banks. They're saying, look, it's up to the banks. The banks get to decide. However, the banks have a lot of incentive to be able to process these loans. Um, so, you know, I, I'm wondering what would disqualify you? What are the major, major concerns? Um, if you're a small business owner, you're now looking at this, you're now saying, okay, I haven't applied yet. I'm wanting to get into this second round or third, whatever round we're in right now. What is it that I should be looking out for? What's going to disqualify me 
from applying and getting money from the Paycheck Protection Program. I can feel that. So, um, and, and Martin can, can weigh in. We've been doing a lot of calls with clients talking through this. So one, um, if you're not a qualified size, so you're over 500, you're in an, in, you know, and you don't have an NAICS code that gives you a higher employee count would be one. Um, if you're unwilling to make the, some of the basic certifications and the loan documentation so that you're going to, you know, you need to make a, a good faith certification that you're going to use the money to retain uh, employees. Um, there are a host of industries that are outright uh, banned. So if you're in gambling uh, or your religious organization or a political lobbying group, I think the other one that, that I got a, you know, a, uh, a kick out of was the, if you're more than a, some portion of your, your uh, revenue comes from purient sexual interests or something like that, which I assume to be the adult entertainment industry, <laughs> you can't take these loans. Um, the, uh, the, the other, uh, I think where we end up spending a decent amount of time and it's important to, to take a minute and talk about here is um, you need to make it, one of the certifications that you need to make in your loan, you have to say that the current state, and I, and I may, I should have the language here in front of me, but for those of you dealing with this issue, you, you may know the words by heart, but the current uh, state of economic uncertainty makes uh makes the loan necessary to maintain ongoing operations right something very uh loose it doesn't say my revenue has to have been cut in half my sales have to have been cut in half i'm going to go out of business next week uh so we have a lot of questions particularly from venture-backed startups you know startups are um you know i, I think of startups as sort of businesses with terminal cancer they have to find a cure or they're they're dead and so they have, we, we refer to that as runway, right? Those of us in the venture space. Yeah. Um, and so uh, it, one startup may be saying, well, geez, I, I run this, I have this online service and my sales have gone up 50%. But I, where I was in the life cycle of my runway, I have to tell you, I would still lay people off because I know I'm not going to be able to raise another round of financing. So um, I personally believe you need to really speak with counsel on this. Uh, I personally believe that um, that uh, those companies are likely eligible, but they should do some soul searching as to why uh, they need that money, how much money they have in the bank. And I think they should be doing some sort of memo to file to document why it is they, they feel that they meet that standard. Uh, I feel it's a pretty loose standard and Congress intentionally set a loose standard. I also think they should hew very, very carefully to maintaining payroll. Um, and I think companies that are on that edge should be careful about um, having both a PR plan, right? And then also talking carefully too with uh, some of their venture backers. And one of the things, and I, I don't want to talk too long on this point and let Martin weigh in, but one of the things that I've seen in this space is particularly more blue chip venture capital firms or firms with larger funds um, may be a little bit more reticent to have their portfolio companies take this money. And I think that's an important thought. Uh, remember, the whole purpose of some of these affiliation rules and some of these other rules in the small business uh, world were designed to prevent government, low interest, favorable money from going to uh, businesses that were owned by wealthy folks or folks that really didn't need this. Uh, and so there are some potential PR headaches if the big, fancy venture capital firms, portfolio companies being bailed out by the government. So um, it is a sincere and real interest on the part of the venture capitalists. Um, but I also think ultimately, Founders and CEOs need to make and have a fiduciary duty to make decisions uh, designed to benefit each of their shareholders. Makes sense. Martin, <clears throat> love to hear from you on this. Oh, I, I, I think Galen cat, catch, uh, catches all the upfront stuff. I think people, as they decide to take these loans, also need to be thinking in a little more detail about how they're going to use them for a couple of reasons. First, the first set of regulations we got added a requirement that wasn't technically in the law. The requirement is that at least 75% of the loan proceeds must be used for payroll costs and payroll costs is a pretty specifically defined set of things. The regulation isn't real clear on what happens if you don't do that. Some people have suggested they'll take away all the forgiveness and you won't get any forgiveness. Some people have suggested that if you do it knowingly, they're gonna take you to court and go after you for fraud. But the point is, have a plan, especially now that there's a 
brief moment before they refund it to, to think about what you're going to do with the money. So really the point is have a plan as to what you're going to do with the money. And part of that plan should be that 75% is going to go towards payroll costs. Yeah. The, the other thing that uh, is worth mentioning uh, really is more on how much is going to be forgiven. That calculation is, I'm going to go with very unclear at the moment. We are expecting some regulations, but the three primary limiters on that calculation and exactly how that's going to work. Um, I think, you know, Gail and I could probably spend eight hours a day for the next 10 days arguing over whether this calculation comes first or that one. The real point to keep in mind is to the extent you drop your wages by more than 25% for any of your employees, drop your head count as compared to various times, either last year or this year, or fail to meet another rule, which, which a lot of people have missed because it was added in the regulations. That rule sounds like the first 75% rule I told you about, but it's a little different. That rule says that no more than 25% of the total amount that will be forgiven can be used on utilities, rent, and mortgage interest. So the simple math there is if you got a PPP loan of a million dollars and during the eight week period following the loan being dispersed to you, you spent $600,000 on payroll costs and then you spent $400,000 on utilities, you're only gonna be able to have $200,000 of the amount spent on utilities forgiven because no more than 25% of the total forgiven amount, in this example, $800,000, can be spent on utilities, rent, or mortgage interest. Long story short, there's some real math problems here that people are gonna to have to deal with on the back end uh, that they, they need to start thinking about. Again, there are no answers on some of them, um, but just having that plan for how you're going to spend the money, I think, makes a massive difference. I think, I think it's very, very helpful. Good information. And, and Galen, I like the way you put it, how um, startups can be. Uh, it, <clears throat> startups have cash problems already. They do. And so it's um, and the, the, the hope I know from many of the startups is, well, maybe this could help me. Is there a way we can access this capital? And I think it's really good advice to make sure that you can show a connection to the, the, the crisis, the economic crisis, that showing that, that you have been impacted. Um, rather than just trying to see this as a way of, of, of giving you additional bridge capital. Is that fair to say? Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. Yeah, you, you, you need to have, uh, that's exactly right. Um, I was going to circle back on two points. I just didn't want to gloss over. One yeah, yeah. was on, on the forgiveness point. Uh, as you, A lot of what's been going on lately that Martin and I have been doing is, hey, I got my loan, what do I do now? And there are some rehire rules uh, where if you hire folks back or you get salaries back by June 30th, 2020, then they will reduce the penalty. So if you had already reduced your headcount, um, they won't count against you for the penalty, so long as you do that by June 30th. One really important point that I want to make, though, is the way that the, the math, as Martin describes it uh, correctly, I think, uh, works out is that your, the maximum amount forgiven it begins to be determined the day that you receive the loan and your payroll costs as of that day. So you may rehire folks by June 30th, but if you don't get that payroll cost number up close to, or at least depending on how the math works out to, to the basis uh, of your original loan, um, you, you're gonna have parts of this loan that won't be forgiven. So there is an incentive to get to, to rehire right away, get, pe get people, uh, get your payroll costs back up. The other thing too, that I wanted to mention, which was the bank point. And again, sorry to circle back so far, Jim, but um, I don't know that I said this. Talk to your current bank, right? The other thing that I recommend, a lot of people may have a national bank. I've seen people have success going to the bank of the corner that you've never heard its name and you walk by a hundred times and never thought to talk to them. They may be less busy. And so it's worth sort of getting in their shorter line where you maybe get a little bit more attention. And then the third one is, there are a variety of online banks and platforms uh, where you could easily, from, you know, from your um, from your dining room table, you could kind of go ahead and try and apply to those as well. Just keep your options open. Okay, I like that. Shop. So keep options open. Shop this around. Look at different banks. If you're rejected from one, go to another bank. Let's try something else. 
I like that. Mm -hmm. Um, Alan, before we launch into um, questions from the audience, anything to add on that? Anything that you're seeing that um, that companies in Indiana um, have been, you know, the banks are looking for something um, and, and what would potentially disqualify them? No, I have to say for the most part, the majority of people we've talked to have felt that the banks have been cooperating pretty well and have been pretty helpful in terms of um, like understanding what they need to do to get the process going. I think Martin made some really good points though about the forgiveness calculation and we're getting questions about that. And I would agree with Martin, that looks pretty fuzzy right now. Okay, all right. Well, well, thank you. That's been, this has been really helpful and I've, I'm, it's great to really understand um, the resources that are out. So we've got a, a tremendous resource. There's also still a whole lot of questions, but then a lot of um, resources and people that we can go to and ask questions. Um, all right, so I'd like to transition now to uh, answering questions from the audience. Uh, and so for the panelists, um, if you were to go to um, more or click on the question and answer button, on your Zoom screen, you will see open questions there. Uh, so multiple individuals have asked questions and um, if there is a, uh, a question that you would like to answer, please go ahead and just click answer live and then just answer it. So we're gonna, we're gonna try this out. Let's use technology here and uh, hopefully it doesn't bite us. <laughs> so can, do you all see those questions? Yeah, well, well, well. Uh, they're looking at those. Why don't I do a quick mention of two other government pieces that are in play here while they find the questions they want to answer? Thanks, Martin. Yeah, that's so perfect. There are two other things you may have heard about, and it's important to understand to some extent what they are and how they interact with the PPP. The first is uh, the employee retention tax credit or the employee retention credit. And that's a very specific program. Uh, it's all governmental, no banks involved. In very simple terms, if your company is shut down in full or in part because of a government order, i.e. The, the various stay at home orders, or if compared to the same quarter last year, you have a gross receipts drop uh, to 50% or lower, then you can qualify for this credit. The credit is based on qualified wages that you pay to your employees. I'm not gonna go into details to what qualified wages are. It's different if you have more or less than 100 employees and that difference is really important. But the fundamental thing to keep in mind is you get a tax credit for 50% of up to $10,000 of qualified wages you pay to an employee. And that's on a per employee basis. So really you can get $5,000 per an employee. But the most important thing about that program is that you cannot use that program if you're using a PPP loan. In very few situations have we seen a PPP loan uh, be the worse answer. The PPP loan tends to be the better answer than just the maximum of 5,000 per head if you meet all the other qualification requirements for the tax credit that I haven't mentioned. But there are certainly circumstances either you don't get in line soon enough on the uh, PPP or for whatever reason it doesn't fit where you may definitely want to be looking at the employee retention tax credit. The other thing that's available to all employers is a deferral of the employer's portion of the social security tax. That 6.2% that the employer pays you don't have to be paying that in now. You, you still have to take the employee's 6.2% and pay that in, but the employer's portion of the social security tax, you don't have to be paying in. Instead, you can defer that 50% until 12-31-2021 and 50% until 12-31-2022. So it's the cheapest loan you'll ever get. Uh, and it's pretty much immediately available to you because it's all about not sending the money in. There is an interaction on this program with the PPP as well. And that is, you can be doing this deferral right now, but the moment you have a PPP loan that gets forgiven, you have to stop doing the deferral. So you can be def making that deferral now, but the loan gets forgiven and you have to stop making that deferral. However, everything you deferred before that point 
can stay deferred until, you know, 50% 2021, 50% 2022. So again, if you're tight on cash, you should be using that. It's only 6.2%, um, but it's something to work with. Excellent. Those are two really great programs. Thank you for bringing that up. Okay, so the, the, the tax deferral, uh, as well as the employee retention credit. Very good. All right, well, I'll turn it over to the panelists to answer questions from the audience. So uh, I can take a, a couple of these and, and, and certainly do so again. Martin and I have been teaming up on a lot of client calls. Uh, there are a bunch of questions here. I think I see 30. Um, I think some of them, many of them hit on a couple topics that I see. So one is the 75% rule. How does it apply? Is it during forgiveness? Is it uh, for the whole loan proceeds? If you really dig into this, and this is, I'll reiterate what Martin said a minute ago, where he said, you know, he and I can talk for 10 hours a day or eight hours a day for 10 days. Um, it's a mess. And, 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 and so I start with, uh, you know, you know that, by the way, that was a provision that was put in. Um, some of these things were put into the regs. They were not in the law. And so when you see it in the regs, you'll see the SBA spilling a page or a page and a half of discussion as to why that should be there. I personally, as a lawyer, always find that means that whoever wrote it was very concerned. They knew that what they were doing was beyond the scope of the law itself. Uh, but under the law, there's some real deference. It's called the Chevron analysis. There's deference to uh, administrative agencies. So what does that mean? I think practically speaking, if you are, we know that you need, the date you take out your loan, you need to get your payroll costs up. And that's a defined term, payroll costs. You need to get that up. Uh, as much as possible in order to uh, maximize the potential maximum forgiveness of your loan. Uh, whether you use 75% of that or 75% of something else, get your payroll costs up as much as you can that, without sort of having people do nothing. Although we know that there are businesses that are going to just say, hey, stay home, we're going to pay you anyways. And that's fine too. We get that question a lot. Uh, but for now, until we get detailed regulations on uh, how to manage the forgiveness and some of these other rules on 75%. I don't know, Martin, would you agree? Just get it up, like try and get it above 75% of your total loan amount. Yeah. I mean, the safest thing you can do is spend more than 75% of payroll costs during the eight week period after you get the loan. And then, you know, you're pretty safe. You're not going to have a real issue. Excellent. Thank you, Galen. Thank you, Martin. All right. I see a question here about the SBA Express Bridge Loan, which is something that we haven't touched on yet. And the question is whether that is a direct application with the SBA or if that is through a bank. And the answer to that is go to the bank. Okay. Excellent. Very good. I see a, uh, oh, go ahead, Martin. I see a, a, a couple of questions here that relate to sole proprietors, independent contractors, and self-employed individuals. Mm -hmm. um, first, I think there's been an extreme amount of confusion on these points, and only some of that confusion has been cleared up. Uh, under the program, the way SBA kind of rolled it out, uh, <clears throat> independent contractors, sole proprietors uh, couldn't make applications until the 10th, the guidance interpreting some important elements of that came out on about the 12th and the money ran out on about the 16th. Um, not a great timeline from the perspective of a sole proprietor or independent contractor. So if you're in that category, I strongly suggest that you start looking at it now, hoping that they're going to refund it so that you can get in early. But there's some very specific rules about how sole proprietors and independent contractors apply. In addition, in the law, there was a very awkward concept of self-employed individuals that a lot of people thought would allow partners in a partnership or owners in an LLC who are considered self-employed, but own, own the LLC with multiple people. It's not just a pure uh, uh, ignored entity. It, it thought maybe they could apply individually. The SBA has made it clear, no, if you are an entity that's taxed as a partnership, then that entity has to apply. And when that entity applies, the payroll costs can include the uh, uh, certain amounts for active partners. And the guidance we have uses the word active. So there's some real still kind of 
lack of clarity or confusion as to whether a, a truly passive business with really no employees, no other way to generate these payroll costs can uh, realistically take advantage of these loans. In addition, there are a few types of passive entities that probably can't apply because the old limitations under the old SBA rules still apply. So if you are in a purely passive business, you know, just straight up real estate ownership, we're not saying you can't, but you, you, that's a good example where you should talk to your lawyer, see where you fit, uh, see what you can work with. If you're a sole proprietor or independent contractor, there is some pretty good guidance as to how you can look at your prior tax return and figure out what your payroll costs are and then how your payroll costs can be calculated for the eight week period after the loan. I would strongly recommend going to that guidance if you're in that sole proprietor or independent contractor bucket. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's one note in here I see on uh, not-for-profits. Uh, and, I, and I think the, the point I'll make there, I think this question really deals with not-for-profits that don't have employees. Uh, the answer is uh, having a payroll cost is the basis for the loan. So if you don't have a payroll cost, uh, there's not a lot under the Paycheck Protection Program for you and really most of the other programs. Remember, so much of the CARES Act about, is about pausing our economy uh, and keeping people paid and then getting it restarted. But I will say, uh, under the traditional SBA rules, nonprofits were not eligible. They were an excluded category of entity uh, that, that could avail itself of some of the SBA loan programs. They are expressly included uh, in the payroll protection program and be subject to the normal normal limits, the headcount, things like that. Okay. Okay. I see a uh, I see a question here. We've been seeing and and people have been struggling with. Uh, and that is, you know, what happens if my office is recommended to stay closed, even for emergencies uh, during this whole period of time? And the, there's a little bit of debate on this subject. Again, you get the loan on the basis of payroll costs, and they're telling you that you have to use 75% of it on payroll costs uh, as the basic use requirement. And of course, you don't know today, you know, what, what your office open or closed status is going to look like. What, what we've been thinking about and talking about is, you know, in some cases, it may be advisable to essentially keep people on the payroll, even though they're not really doing anything. Understand that creates some other awkward issues. This PPP program did not replace all the other employment and wage laws out there. So, for example, uh, a common concern that we have is, uh, if you keep people on the payroll, you might still have to look to your health plan and see if it has what we call an actively at work requirement. So maybe, arguably, those people aren't actively at work, even though you're keeping them on the payroll for 40 hours a week and paying them so that you have payroll costs, so that you're meeting the 75% use requirement and maybe getting some forgiveness. So don't assume that just because you're trying to do something to help you know, get forgiveness or to meet the 75% use requirement, that there aren't other legal issues that you do need to be thinking about uh, and, and looking at. Yeah, that's a great point. Very good point. Very good point. We, we've got a couple more minutes before we move into concluding remarks. Uh, we could probably get maybe two more questions. So, uh, Martin uh, and Alan, you may have different thoughts on this, but one thing that comes up a lot too is, geez, should I do the, the Paycheck Protection Program or the EIDL or can I do both and how does that work? And I see some questions in here talking about that. Um, the answer is you can do both. You cannot use both for the same purpose. Um, so you need to use one for payroll and one for rent, so to speak. Um, the other thing, too, that I think is and will get confusing, you want to just keep a close eye on, is when you, um, when you apply for forgiveness, your forgiveness is, so if you do do both, when you apply for forgiveness of your payroll pro uh, protection program amount, uh, it will be reduced by any amount you have received as a grant. So the free $10,000 would automatically be reduced. That reduces your forgivable amount. Um, so that's one thing. And then... Uh, when you apply for the, the, uh, the EID or the payroll protection program, 
they also ask you, hey, have you taken out, have you taken out an EIDL emergency loan uh, or received the, um, I believe if you've received the, the grant portion, you're allowed to increase the max amount that you take out uh, to account for that. Excellent. Yeah, uh, if I could elaborate just one piece of that. Um, Galen, the guidance we've received is that if you have both loans, um, you cannot use them for the same purpose simultaneously, but you may be able to use them sequentially. So some of the strategizing that we're seeing uh, is people getting the PPP loan, using that for eight weeks for payroll, and then using idle proceeds for payroll after that eight week period after they burn through the PPP. Uh, the guidance we've gotten to this point says that's okay. I haven't seen that distinction in, in the regs, uh, but but I learn something new every day on this. I'm, I'm happy to look at that. I just haven't seen that distinction. Martin, have you seen that? I, you know, I have heard talk of it, but I haven't uh, found where in the rules and regs it actually comes out that way. And, and that may be uh, something that I think is going to be common here, and that is your, your uh, written answers may be a little bit different than some of your practical answers in terms of how this program gets dealt with by SBA and or your bank. For example, when the dust all settles, I bet you will be able to go and look at what bank A did and what bank B did and see that they did fundamentally different things um, and that's just the way it was because of the time frame and pressure of all of this. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, um, I, I gotta say, this has been really helpful and really educational for me. Um, and um, I, I believe we're gonna go through the remaining questions and try to answer as many as we possibly can and provide that information to all of the participants of this webinar. So um, on behalf of all the participants, I'd like to really thank all of you, uh, Galen, Martin, Alan, thank you so much. Uh, this has been wonderful. And I'm wondering if, if each one of you could just take maybe a minute it, to conclude and, and just give us, you know, any, any parting remarks. Um, it, and it may be, you know, what do you see that um, we should be thinking about? What's next on the horizon or, or any advice you'd give to startups? Uh, so why don't we start with um, Martin? Could you start and then we go Martin, Alan, and, and end with Galen? Sure, happy to. So I think in the big picture, this is a wonderful program. If you can take appropriate advantage of it, you should be doing so. I think the, you know, the devil as always is in the details. One of the things I've said to a lot of people is when you get this money, put it in a bank account and make sure you're just using that bank account, that money for the things you're supposed to use on, use it for under the program, making it easy to track and easy to show what you've done. It's, it's, it's gonna be a lot of paperwork on the back end, uh, so people should be prepared for that. Yeah. But again, wonderful program, I think well worth it. Uh, so as, as much as there are 100 kinks to work out, uh, it, this is doing a lot of good. Great point. Alan? Yeah, I would echo, I think the good has far outweighed the bad, despite the fact there have been challenges. Um, obviously, because the program was put together very quickly, uh, there's been a lot of interpretation, there's been a lot of change along the way. The uh, situation has changed daily, sometimes hourly. So as we anticipate more funding coming into uh, the PPP and hopefully back into the IDLE program as well. I would just encourage everybody, monitor sba.gov for updates uh, and look for the latest information. And when you see funding starting to drop, move fast. Thank you, Ellen, great point. Galen. Yeah, I agree. I, I think the program has been amazing. I, I personally hope that it becomes unlimited and that there's so, you know, that anyone that, that qualified during this time period gets it. It feels uh, a little strange to me that maybe in another week or two, we're back here again for uh, folks that didn't get the first come first serve, which are terms, which is a phrase actually used in the regs. It's very surprising. Um, so, uh, but, but the good has been amazing and, and keeping people on the payroll. So one, keep people on the payroll. Uh, the other thing I would just leave as a persnickety venture lawyer is, um, 
you know, be sure your board's approving, kicking out the loan. You're having a board meeting to do that. You're doing things appropriately and, and going through all your normal governance stuff. Wonderful advice. Thank you again, uh, Martin, Galen, and Alan. We really appreciate it. Um, and to all of our participants, thank you so much for attending. Uh, and on, on behalf of the University of Notre Dame, I say, you know, God bless and please stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you.